Welcome to the OCC Podcast. Whether you're listening to this at home, on the road, at work, or in the gym, we're so glad you decided to join us as we study God's Word together. We hope and pray that through this ministry, you will grow in your relationship with God as well as become a chair for disciple maker. But for now, sit back and let us help you see how the Bible applies to your life today. All right. Obviously a little more set up for a guy who's not incredibly mobile, but it is good to be with you here 11 days after they took a saw to my knee. So I'm excited to be here with you. Yeah, that, <laughs> that part, praise the Lord. And then let's be honest, medicine is pretty cool. I, I've, I haven't had a lot of surgeries in my life. Having a surgery in December is kind of neat. I wasn't aware of this. They give you a choice between regular anesthesia or peppermint scented, which was really nice. So I, t- I took the, I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> Once I got the anesthesia, I don't remember anything. Right? So, but it is very, very good to be here, that's for sure. And so for those of you who have joined us uh, live and in person today, for those watching online who are planning on coming tonight, just on behalf of myself, the staff, the ministry council, Merry Christmas. We are so, so glad, not only, again, that you're here today, but that OCC is your church home, and, and that is fun. So we're going to jump in and study. We've got the opportunity to kind of wrap up our Advent series. And if you've been with us through the month of December, you know we've been focusing on things that we get to celebrate because Jesus came the first time as a little baby born in the manger. We get hope and love and peace and joy. And then we also focus a whole lot on the things that we do get to celebrate for eternity because Jesus is coming again. And and so that's exciting for us. We talked about those those character qualities and hope and peace and love and joy to set up talking today a lot about Jesus. This is the advent of Jesus Christ. He is the one who makes all those things possible. So heavy on Jesus today, and we love that. And, and, And we're talking about Jesus Christ. We understand that's not his last name, right? Christ, Messiah, those are terms that literally mean anointed one. Jesus was anointed by God, and there was a particular purpose why he was anointed, and that was to save mankind from our sin. And he accomplished that through his death and his burial and his resurrection. That's an incredible thing that we talk about. We kind of introduced that concept last week when we talked about what salvation really means. If you're here, if you remember, we said that means being rescued from the darkness. That means being redeemed from the wages of sin delivered from being eternally separated from God to getting to spend eternity with him in heaven. And we could talk forever about that. I don't know if that's a topic we spend enough time talking about any time, but it's real easy to crowd that out during the holiday season. Because if you're like me, it's just so easy to get distracted this time of year. There's so much other stuff. There are parties and lights and decorations and cooking and baking and shopping and wrapping. Oh, goodness, the wrapping of presents. You guys know how many presents I wrapped this year? Yes, that's right, zero. <laughs> I was absolutely no help in wrapping presents this time of year. Christina wrapped every present literally until Macy came home. All the kids came home Wednesday, and then she bailed her brothers out and wrapped them. You know. but, but here's the thing that I feel kind of bad about in this, and, and I don't like to brag. That's a lie. <laughs> I do like to brag. Uh, but, but here's the thing. I'm really good at wrapping presents. I am an excellent gift wrapper. And that hasn't always been the case, but for those of you who know my story, I worked 16 years in retail and sporting goods, and I became a very good gift wrapper, right? But I started that job when I was 16 years old, and I was horrible. (laughs) I don't think I'd ever wrapped a present, honestly, before then. And so that first Christmas, as I'm learning how to wrap, my first several boxes were not good, (laughs) I just stunk at wrapping gifts. And it's one of those things, like if, if you're good at it, you, you got good at it by doing it a lot, right? You get better and better as you go. But by the end of that first Christmas, I could wrap like a standard size shirt box pretty well. It, it wasn't, you know, anything to write home about, but, but I could at least hand it to somebody and not be embarrassed, right? But the issue I had then, and really still the issue I have today, I think almost everybody has with wrapping, how much wrapping paper do you use? That's still where I mess up. And, and, and there's two options and you can mess up. You, you get not quite enough or you get way, way, way too much. Right? And both of those create problems. If you get not quite enough, you end up with that present that has that one. Little, like, it's just not good. And I'll go ahead and save you on this one right now. If you get something like this, just start over, okay? Because it's never going to go well. You try and cut that little sliver that looks like it might match up, and then you try and match the pattern up, and then it ends up shiny because you put 14 pieces of tape on it. You're better just to start again, right? And and so I I normally don't make that mistake. I err the other way, and you end up with that package that looks like it's going to explode because there's just so much paper. And you're like, 
I've given away some of those too, right? Both of those are kind of rough. And you get better with the practice, I, I promise. But, but I'll never forget that first Christmas Eve that I was working in retail. And that's where the guy who owned the sporting goods store would do his shopping, right? And his shopping consisted of going to the lowliest of employees and saying, get this and wrap it and put it on my desk. And, and I was the lowliest of employees that year. And the thing he asked me to get and wrap was a case of tennis balls. Now, the thing I had going for me was it was already in a box, right? That was helpful, but it was a big box. It was much bigger than anything I had ever wrapped at that point in my life, and I butchered. <laughs> when I got done, it literally looked like somebody had kicked it off a truck and then kicked it down the street. It just, it looked really, really bad. A lot, way too much paper, right? But it was the best I could do. It was all I knew to do. And so I carried this box back to his office and I set it on his desk and then I returned to my job just waiting to be fired. I was like, this is how I'm gonna end here. And so he had been out running errands, doing other stuff, and he came back to get his gifts that were gonna be wrapped in the office and, and I was waiting. I was just waiting because I thought, this is it. I'm, I'm gonna lose this job. And, and, and so he started walking out to his car and he was carrying this case of tennis balls. And it was beautiful. The wrapping was pristine, sharp corners, straight edges. It had a beautiful bow on the top. It was just absolutely incredible. Somebody had gone in and, and rewrapped it. Somebody went in and salvaged this mess that I made. I learned years later it was my boss, a sweet, sweet guy. I ended up working with him for 16 years. He liked me, and he didn't want me to get fired on Christmas Eve, which was really, really sweet. So he looked at that mess that I made, and he went in and he rewrapped it salvaged the wreck that I had created because I needed help and I got it. And that's what we're going to talk about today, about needing help, about needing to be saved, however we want to use the terminology, rescued, redeemed, delivered, salvaged. One of the verses we're going to look at in the Christmas story explains what the story is truly all about. It's Luke chapter 2 and verse 30. It says this, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Now, those words are spoken to God by a man named Simeon, and he just happened to be holding the baby Jesus at the time. And Simeon does something that is absolutely incredible in this passage. If you think estimating how much gift wrap you need is hard, there are tougher things in this world to predict, right? Try predicting the weather. People get paid to do that, and they're not good at it. Right? Try to predict this year's Super Bowl winner. I know who it's not going to be, Cleveland Browns fans, sorry. But, but we don't know who it is going to be, Right? Making predictions is hard. And what Simeon does in this actual account is he holds this little baby boy, less than a month old, and he predicts with 100% accuracy what's going to happen in the life and the future of this child. So if you have your Bible with you, grab that. Turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. Luke is the third book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke. If you don't have a Bible with you, if you grabbed an outline coming in, you'll have that and we'll have it on the screens as well. But, but this is part of the Christmas story. It's just not a part we hear very often, right? When we hear the Christmas story, we focus on the stuff earlier in Luke. We think about the nativity scene stuff, right? Baby Jesus has to be in there. We put him in last, but he has to be there. Mary and Joseph, we talk about the shepherds. We talk about the wise men. They weren't even there, and we talk about them. The animals get more credit than this guy. The animals are in all the songs. The cattle are lowing. Yeah. The ox and lamb keep time. In this passage, we introduce a new character. Simeon becomes part of the Christmas story too. So we're going to read this text and see what role he plays with his just incredible spot-on prediction about what's going to happen because of and through the life of Jesus. This is Luke chapter 2. Let's start in verse 25. Now, there's a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So what do we know about Simeon? He's a very righteous guy, and way down deep inside, he knows there's more to come, right? He is expectant because of some promises that he's aware of from God's word. People back in the day, we know there was no printing press, there was no internet yet. It was harder to spread news, but people still did it. They gossiped, they talked, right? Oral tradition carried the message. And so things we can read so clearly in the Old Testament of our Bible, people just talked about. Things like Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. 
It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. What's the sign going to be? Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Simeon knew about that verse. He talked with people about that verse. He also knew a couple chapters later, Isaiah makes another prediction. Chapter 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called, and we know these wonderful names, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice, with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, it says, The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is what Simeon is all excited about. These predictions from our Old Testament, biblically we call them prophecies. Isaiah had made these about how God was going to deal with his people in the future. And so when we meet Simeon here in Luke chapter 2, he's righteous, he's devout, and he's expectant. He's waiting to see these prophecies fulfilled. He's looking specifically for the consolation of Israel. It's a neat word. It means comfort or encouragement. And so at some point in time in this text, we're not exactly sure, the Holy Spirit shows up for Simeon. And he says this incredible thing. Hey, you're not leaving this earth. You're not going to die until you see Jesus Christ with your own eyes. You're going to see how God is going to fulfill that prophecy that he spoke through Isaiah 700 years earlier. Now, this is what we like to do. Just think practically here. This happened to Simeon, okay? This isn't make-believe. What if it happened to you or me? What if the Holy Spirit came to us personally and told us about some amazing thing that was going to happen before we die? How would we wake up every morning? My bounding skills are a little... (laughs) We'd literally throw the covers off and we'd bounce out of bed, right? We'd be so excited. My bounding skills are so poor, I'm reminded that I'm supposed to sit down. (laughs) My doctor's orders say this is what you're supposed to do. Here's the the way to think of it if you've got little kids or you've had little kids and you see this. How excited are little kids about Christmas morning? Right? They just can't barely contain themselves. They can't wait. That's the kind of excitement, that's the kind of expectation that we see. Well, that's what Simeon's got going on. (laughs) Woohoo! Sorry, a little housekeeping here. That might work or not. Let's get a little bit closer. Would it be easier to move this or my chair? Let's try this. That's it right there. (laughs) Thanks for the commercial break. (laughs) But but this is the beauty of what Simeon is dealing with. He's just excited, right? And all of God's chosen people were excited. They'd been waiting for a long time to see how these prophecies that Isaiah had made were going to play out. There might be more. I can count at least 16 prophecies in Isaiah that are fulfilled by Jesus' coming, by the life and work of the Christ that were written 700 years before we meet Simeon here in the temple. They've been waiting a long time. And Simeon hears what? Directly from the Holy Spirit. It's going to be soon. It's going to happen in your lifetime. It's going to happen before you die. And so I think he wakes up every day just pumped to the gills. Now, this is what actually happens in verses 27 to 32 of our text, but I want to preview this. The the Holy Spirit shows up and and gives this incredible news to Simeon. You're going to see Jesus before you die, and then the Holy Spirit shows up again, and he tells Simeon, you're going to go somewhere, specifically to the temple. Now, don't you know Simeon's got to be even more fired up now? He'd heard from the Holy Spirit one time, you're going to see this incredible thing. Now, the Holy Spirit shows up again and tells him specifically to go somewhere, So you know Simeon's like, that's going to be the place. Something big is happening today, right? That's got to be Simeon's attitude. Look what happens, verse 27. And so Simeon came in the spirit into the temple, and when the parents, this is Mary and Joseph, brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, that's where they're going to dedicate Christ, Simeon snatches him. This is a little weird. And took Jesus up in his arms and blessed God. And he said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. What's he doing? He's holding his salvation in his arms. Can we imagine this? That you've prepared in the presence of all peoples a light. We'll talk more about the light tonight in the candlelight service. It would be gorgeous. It's a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Take a real quick time out and just say, 
We're thinking a lot about the people of Israel right now. And in God's word and through God's promises, there has always been a literal future for national Israel. It does not change and it will not change. (laughs) Amen? Here in verse 30, Luke uses a great word. It's the Greek word soterion. And it means exactly what it's translated to mean. Salvation. Big word, fun word. The, The root is soter. And it means deliverance. It means rescue. It means that Christ can save people. And Luke loves this concept, and so he uses it a bunch. Almost 30 times in the Gospel of Luke and the sequel, the the Acts of the Apostles, he uses this word because Luke, I think just like me, is blown away by what this word means. This little baby boy that Simeon is holding, that he just made these wild predictions about, he's going to be the light of revelation to all the people. Simeon grew up hearing about these prophecies, and, and here's the fulfillment of the prophecies that people have been waiting for. That little baby is going to grow to be a man, but not just any man. He's going to be the God man. He's going to be fully God and fully man, God incarnate, and he alone can save people. He's the one who can rescue people. He can salvage people like my boss salvaged my horrible Christmas wrapping. What did that look like tangibly? My boss swept in and took that mess that I made and made it something else. He made it breathtaking. Salvage is a neat word. We don't use it that often. I mean, really, we only use it if we're talking about old cars. But in light of our subject matter today, I looked it up in the online dictionary. It's a neat word. And I clicked the word origin link, and it just said save, right? And I was like, I think I get that. So I clicked the synonym link. It said rescue. I'm like, this is a good word. But the part that I really love was the definition. Do we know the definition of salvage? In part, it reads to save used, damaged, or rejected goods for recycling or further use. That's what Jesus can do. And that's pretty impressive. And and don't raise your hand, but does anybody here feel used or damaged or rejected sometimes? Well, then praise the Lord, God sent Jesus. (laughs) Born as a baby, born to a very unlikely mother, this teenage virgin named Mary. That's whose birthday we're celebrating tomorrow. And in our passage, that's the little baby that Simeon is holding. He is the one God sent. He is the one who's come to save, to rescue. Let me share the rest of the definition because this brings it home. Salvation, to save from certain destruction. Now that's what happens when we become Christ followers. We are salvaged from certain destruction. And so here in verse 30 of Luke chapter 2, Simeon says, I'm good. You can take me home now, Lord, because I've seen it. It's my salvation, and it's available for whom? I love this. All peoples. Do we catch that? Do we, do we know what that does for us? All peoples means there's nobody in this room. There's nobody watching online and go, well, that ain't for me. No, you'd be wrong. Salvation has been prepared in the presence of all peoples. It's for you and me. It can benefit everyone if we profess faith in Christ. So here's the big question for today. Is our life messy? Do we feel like we messed it up? Maybe we're the ones who are making it messy. We've made bad choices. We've had wrong relationships. We kind of started down a sketchy path, and the next thing you know, we're on a real slippery slope, and we're just plunging down. And after a while, it seems like way too much work to try and stop the fall, turn around, and climb back up. One of my favorite little scenes from from one of my favorite Christmas movies, The Christmas Story, where Ralphie asks for the thing that he wants more than anything, the official Red Rider BB gun with the compass and the stock and the thing that tells time. And he gets his big chance to ask for it, and you remember he freezes up. Can't get it out, and he gets put on the slide and boot to the face, and he starts sliding down. And he's sliding down. Do you remember what he does? He sticks his arms and his legs out, and he stops his fall. And he turns, and he clamors up the slide to make his request. That's hard work, isn't it? Do we think we can stop the fall on our own, or do we need some help getting back up to the top? Does our life look as bad as that case of tennis balls I wrapped 39 years ago? Would a little salvaging really benefit us this Christmas? If we say that it would, I want to encourage us, that's why Jesus came. That's every bit of what we're celebrating today. That's what Christmas is all about. And that's what Simeon is predicting while holding the baby. 
who was going to grow and be the offer of salvation for all people. He's going to be the light of the world. This is an incredible prediction. And I want us to look at how Simeon's words are received by other important characters in the story, Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph. This is verse 33. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about Jesus. Now, if you have kids, you get this. Like, it's super nice if people come to you and say nice things about your kids. We love that. But come on. I mean, this is over-the-top news for Mary and Joseph, right? But look what happens next. Simeon says all these great things, and then he kind of pulls Mary aside. This is verse 34 and 35. Simeon blessed them both, and then he said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rising of many in Israel. It's opposite. And for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Do we like to make predictions about our own kids? I've been predicting my son Trace will be a professional baseball player for years. I'm going to keep predicting that. I like that one. I was talking with my wife yesterday. I, I, we want to start predicting that our kids might actually get married and get busy making us grandkids because I'm so ready. And I want to still be able to pick them up. Like I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to be 80 before we get grandkids, right? And, and, and predictions, they're fun to make. One of those might frustrate my kids a little bit. But, well, what about this prediction that Simeon offers Mary? This one's tough. He pulls her aside and he says, hey, guess what? This is all incredible, but your boy is going to be very divisive. Because of your son, there's only going to be two options moving forward. Rise or fall. That's it. What happens when we fall? It'd be pretty easy for me to do right now. Most of the time when we fall, it's because we trip over something, right? Simeon is predicting a lot of people are going to trip over Jesus. The offer of salvation is going to be right before them, and they're not going to see it, and they're going to stumble over the Savior. This happens. I don't, I don't know if you've ever been sharing the gospel with somebody and you just point blank ask the question, do you need to be saved? And a lot of people say what? Bah, humbug, I don't need it. Do we understand? That, that's one of the necessities of being saved is recognizing that we need it. Mentioned earlier, I think the most common usage of the word salvage is certainly in the auto industry. Does anybody salvage a brand new car? Right off the assembly line, bright and shiny? No, we don't do that. What kind of cars do we salvage? Ones that have been totaled. Ones that have been in a wreck. They're smashed. They're headed towards certain destruction. If you haven't seen it, you've certainly seen it in the movies. They're on the big magnet, and they bring them over, and they're, they're hanging over the big cube that's going to turn them into twisted metal. And, and what's going to happen? They're either going to fall and, and be crushed, or before it gets totaled, before it gets compacted, what do we do? We ask that question. Is there anything we can salvage? If it was a front-end collision, can we steal the parts off the back? Because those still look pretty good. Can, can we recycle those for further use before it falls into that car crusher and, and gets cubed? The good stuff will be then what? Lifted up. That, that's the other camp that Simeon mentions because of Jesus. Some, some stuff's going to fall into the crusher. Other stuff will rise. So those of us who come to Jesus humbly, we're going to be lifted up. Those who trip and fall but recognize the need for salvation, they're going to be lifted up, amen? This is an incredibly accurate prediction from Simeon. There's a neat illustration in the Bible for this. If you have your Bible with you, flip over a few chapters to Luke chapter 23. But while you're navigating there, let me just remind us, this baby Jesus grew to be a man. This is the guy who lived the perfect sinless life on this earth. But we know, reading the Gospels, he was opposed. He was persecuted. Jesus was sentenced to death for telling the truth. He was crucified on the cross, and there he took the wrath for my sin, for your sin, all our sins, past, present, and future. And he died, and he was buried, and that's not the end of the story. It would be if he were just a man, but he's not. He's the God-man. He's God incarnate. So what do we know? He rose again. and He conquered sin and death. And after his resurrection, he ascended into heaven. He's gone to prepare a place for every person on this fallen planet who professes faith in him. That's how much God loves his creation. So much that he sent his son to make this offer of salvation. Now anyone who accepts God's grace, we can be what? We can be recycled. We can be put to further use. Theological term is we can be reconciled. 
Because sin entered this world and mankind was given a choice. Do you want to choose God or do you want to be selfish? And we choose selfishness. Ever since Adam and Eve made that first selfish decision, humans have been damaged. What does that mean? We're destined for certain destruction. We're hanging there on the big magnet and we're going to drop in the car crusher unless we recognize our need to be saved. So Simeon predicted Jesus is going to come and he's going to be divisive. And that division he's talking about is there are going to be some people who profess faith in Jesus. They will rise. They will be saved. There'll be others who trip over Jesus and they're going to fall. And those people will be eternally separated from God. They won't benefit from this offer of salvation that Simeon is holding in his hands as a little baby. But I love Luke chapter 23 because there we see this phenomenal illustration of that divide. And it comes in the fact that there were two robbers who were crucified with Jesus. Do you remember this? One on his right, one on his left. They provide the illustration. This is Luke 23 starting in verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at Jesus saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked his buddy. He said, do you not fear God? since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, we've been robbing, right? We're we're criminals. We're receiving the due reward of our deed. But this man, he's done nothing wrong. And so that criminal said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You remember what Jesus said to him? Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise you read the gospel accounts, you know that Jesus was opposed. He was persecuted. Well, dear goodness, here on the cross, he was opposed. And Mary was there watching her son's crucifixion. And I'm thinking about it this week. I wonder, did she remember Simeon's words from just over 30 years earlier when he predicted that a sword would pierce her soul? When he said, your son's going to be divisive, but he'll be divisive with a purpose? so that the thoughts of many hearts would be revealed? Who are those hearts revealed to? It's not me. It's God. God is the one who sees hearts. Folks, here's the deal. If we think we're hiding something from God deep down in our heart, we're just kidding ourselves. We're not. Our hearts are an open book to God. He knows all our stuff. God knows all our joys and all our injustices, right? He knows all our pride. He knows all our prejudices. He knows all our rationalizations. He knows all our racism. He knows all our hope. He knows all our hypocrisy. He knows all our dreams. He knows all our desires. He knows all our fears. He knows all our failures. He knows all our love. He knows all our lusts. He knows. He knows. He knows what we think about him. God's the one who's going to look into our hearts and make the decision about our eternal destiny. And when he looks in our heart, there's going to be one thing and one thing only that he's looking for. And if you're tracking with me, if you realize there's a great divide for all of mankind and some are going to rise and some are going to fall and we want to be in the group that rises, we know what God is looking for. Amen? It's faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in this person we're talking about today who came as a little baby. God knows our hearts. They're revealed to him so we can see if we have faith. And here's the bottom line. Nobody gets to have a neutral position about Jesus. It doesn't really exist. He's the dividing line, just like the two criminals on the cross. They represent every living soul. And the dividing line question is, have we professed faith? I don't know why you're here today. I don't get to see hearts the way God does. Maybe you're here because this is your church and you come on Sundays and that's fantastic and we are so glad you're here. But maybe you're here because you're in visiting relatives for Christmas and they came to church and you came to make them happy. You know it's going to make your spouse happy or your parents happy or whatever. Maybe you just like getting dressed up and singing the songs. Maybe you came because you heard that I had surgery and you wanted to see if I'd fall off the stage with my bionic knee. That'd be cool, right? Maybe you saw a yard sign stuck in somebody's yard. Maybe you saw a post on social media. It doesn't matter. You're here. So let's not miss this opportunity to talk about who is going to rise and who is going to fall based on the accuracy of Simeon's prediction. 
based on the journey of Jesus Christ to the cross so that he can salvage people. Let's talk about it. And, and listen, just know, this is not me judging you. I don't see hearts. This is me sharing. Simeon's prediction came 100% true. Professing faith in Jesus is the dividing line. I mean, I can point to, to God's word through Luke's pen in Acts chapter 2 and verse 21. He's actually recording Peter's words. It says, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isn't that what Simeon said? His eyes had seen this salvation that was in the presence of all the people. And you don't have to take God's word for it or Luke's word for it or, or, or Simeon's or Peter's. Paul says it many times in Scripture. Romans 10, 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. You can go Old Testament. There are people who made great predictions just like uh, Isaiah did. Joel does it in chapter 2, verse 32. There's a bunch of stuff. It's not just Pastor James saying it. So we have to ask and answer this question. Do we need to be salvaged? Are we hanging there on the magnet and we don't want to drop, we want to rise? then profess faith in Jesus. That's all it takes. I don't see hearts. If you're here and your take is, I don't believe any of this stuff you're talking about, then God knows your heart. And I'm praying that you trip and fall. And that's not mean-spirited, I promise. I, I pray that you just fall so you'll recognize your need to be lifted up. That's what God does. He saves anyone who responds. And very, very often, I know that happened in my life, we got to fall, we got to hit the bottom before we recognize which side of the dividing line we're on. There's lots of different places we can be as we're traveling down that path. You might be here today saying, well, I think God exists, but man, all this talk about Jesus being the only way, that, that's a bridge too far. If that's our take, we're in the fall category. We need to rest, recognize our need to be saved. Maybe we're here and we think, well, I think Jesus was a real guy. I get that. I think he was a prophet probably. But there are a bunch of prophets. I'm sure he was a really wise guy just like all those other guys. If that's what we believe, we're in the fall category. If our camp is, man, I bet Jesus was a great teacher. We could learn a lot from imitating him. That's a fall. I think Jesus was a good man, but I don't think he was God. That's a fall. I think Jesus was God, but I don't think he died on the cross. That's a fall. I think Jesus was God. I think he died on the cross, but everything else is made up. I don't think he rose from the dead. That's a fall. I think Jesus was God. I think he did die. I think he did rise again, but it's all a story. It's all just history. I don't think it has any impact on anybody's life. That's a fall. I want to love you enough to speak the truth and love this Christmas. Because this is the test. Eternal life is on the line, and Jesus Christ is the line. So are we going to trust in Jesus and rise? Seems like a good spot for a sermon illustration. And I'm supposed to move every few minutes. Are we going to fall? That's the question we have to ask and answer. And we're here talking about it today because of Christmas. Christmas is tomorrow. I already know what I'm going to get. And it's not, I mean, like I could have got under the tree and started poking. <laughs> I already know what I'm going to get because I already got it four months ago. We got a new refrigerator. It was very, very exciting. It's not the most romantic of gifts. I, I've had two knee surgeries this year. I had a son who had a knee surgery. We had a car that was totaled. We had this refrigerator go out. Our gift-giving budget was slim. Uh, and so Christine and I decided in a very romantic gesture, let's get this refrigerator for one another. And now here's the deal, right? We love the fridge. You can't really be without a fridge, a family as big as ours, right? So, so having the fridge is great. But, but here's the thing about a refrigerator. I'm only going to receive the benefits of having that refrigerator if I do what? Go, go plug it in the spot that it fits there in my kitchen and plug it into the electricity and turn it on and use it to cool things, to freeze things, right? If I get a brand new refrigerator and use it as the world's largest doorstop, I, that's just foolish. If we'd brought that new refrigerator in and I flipped it on its side and rolled it in the living room and made it the world's biggest coffee table, that, that's foolish. I'm not using it for the purpose that it was designed for. Maybe you don't know what you're getting this year. Might be a case of tennis balls under the tree for you. You don't know. I bet there's a present for you somewhere, right? There's a box sitting under a tree somewhere with shiny paper, beautiful bow, probably got a gift tag with your name on it. Let me just tell you this right now. If you leave this service right now and go home and just stare at that present until tomorrow comes, 
If you think about that present and consider that gift and evaluate the gift wrapping, it might be small enough you can pick it up and shake it and try and hear what it is. If you do all those things and never open that gift, it's not really yours. If we don't open the gift, we won't benefit from the gift. Whatever the purpose, whatever the design, we may as well not even know about the gift if we're not going to open it. Now, why am I telling us this? There's a whole lot of people who know some things about Jesus. They believe some things about Jesus, but they don't personally trust him for salvation. And if we don't put our faith in him for salvation, it's like getting a brand new refrigerator and not stocking it with tremendous Diet Coke, right? That, that's bad because that's its purpose, not just Diet Coke, other things. But if we come to Jesus and say, I believe all those things about you. I believe you are the God-man. I believe you did die. I believe you were buried. I believe you rose again in order to salvage me. And I'm going to put my faith in you. Then we're going to open that gift. And if we do that, God will rescue us by his grace through that profession of faith. That's the message of Christmas. Our lives are messy. And we are headed for certain destruction on our own. So somebody needs to come in and salvage our mess. Somebody needs to look at our poorly wrapped gift like my boss did and come in and say, man, I can, I can help with that. That's why I'm standing here today because 29 years ago, I hit rock bottom. After running all my ideas about what I thought about God past him, after trying to rescue myself and, and make myself happy, I finally gave up. And I held out my hands. And I received the gift of grace and praise the Lord, I opened it. And that gift was Jesus. It was a personal relationship with the God who came to save used, damaged, and rejected goods for further use. And so here I am, praying every time that I stand out here in front of you that God will continue to use me. So that's the question. Do we want to be salvaged today? We can be. Maybe the Holy Spirit drew you to OCC today the same way he drew Simeon to the temple. And you are here at this moment to profess that you know Jesus is the dividing line of all eternity. And what we believe in him is going to determine whether we rise or whether we fall. And if we're here today to admit we can't rise on our own, life is messy and we often help make it a mess and we need someone to come and rescue us, we can ask Jesus to save us right now, right here. And he will. He will. We close our service almost every time by giving folks the opportunity to, to go to the cross and, and talk with people, pray with people. And, and we're going to do that as well today. And so if you're here at this service and you haven't professed faith in Jesus, I hope and pray that you'll take this time to recognize your need for salvation and your eternal life can begin right now. You can open that gift. I'm going to close with one more song. After that, you'll have the opportunity to pray with somebody. I, I just want to say Merry Christmas. Thank you so much for coming and being part of what God is doing here. And I hope and pray that we'll see you at one of the candlelight services tonight, okay? Love you guys. Let's pray. Father God, this is such an incredible message to, to hear about Simeon, the predictions he made, how it was all orchestrated by your sovereign plan. But God, the, the reality of what he's talking about is we know the dividing line. We know the determination between whether we rise and spend eternity with you or whether we fall and we're eternally separated from you comes in that profession of faith. So God, if today is the day of salvation for someone who is here, someone who's watching online and they want to go talk to someone who they know with all their heart knows and loves Jesus, God, I pray that they will answer and be obedient to that call. God, today there will be parties in heaven just like we had a party over the baptism today over folks who become children of God here at Christmas. God, we love you and we praise you. We ask all that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for listening. If you would like to give to our ministry, please check out our website at lewistonocc.org. And don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe to this podcast as well as our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram so you're always up to date with what's going on here at Orchards Community Church. Take care and God bless.